everyone. It's a pleasure. Um, I am, I don't see you guys yet, but I'm sure you're, I trust, I have trust. Um, so I just wanted to say we are uh, beginning a conversation. Michelle, very nice to see you. And John is here. Yep. I can see okay, you. <laughs> cool. Well, that's, hi. Okay, so um, first of all, guys, thanks so much for joining us uh, and being part of our network and boundary list. We're, we're really always delighted to have you uh, in conversation thinking with us. The, uh, the topic today is one that is not unusual for either of you having to do with um, local and global, the tensions that, that lie there, the, um, the natural pull towards one or the other at different moments of time. I think that you know, for me uh, personally, the the biggest challenges that I think we have in the in the coming decades are systemic and global, being uh, climate and inequality and other biological, uh, you know, things that can be unleashed that we may or may not be prepared for, such as what we're living through now. Um, and I think that you know, as we if, as we think about building uh, or trying to support or shape more resilient and healthy communities and societies. Uh, we, I, you know, you two are, are the top two people to have a conversation with in my mind, so here you are. Um, Michelle Bowens, for those of you that don't know, is uh, a founder of many peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, I, would, I would call ideologies, frameworks, and uh, models for thinking. Um, Michelle has created the Peer to Peer Foundation, uh, is a proponent of the co all things uh, around the commons, at least from my perspective. And Michelle, you often say, and I am really interested in hearing your perspective uh, around uh, that <clears throat> technology is never neutral. Um, so I think that that's an important concept as we think about this local global piece. And John, um, most of your work that I'm familiar with is around the, the, your, your claim, and uh, which I'm curious what the evidence is, I, I'm optimistic and curious, uh, about a rapid shift towards self-organizing networks. And so I know that you uh, have done a lot of work around the, the TIM uh, concept, the framework, as well as just the general idea of self-reliance, which uh, for you seems to be very grounded at the local level. So um, to kick us off, I would love to ask each of you, um, there's kind of this dance between local resilience and global cooperation. Um, how do you see the balance or the tension uh, being resolved over the, the coming five to 10 years? Do you want to start, uh, John, or? John? No, go ahead, please. Uh, Okay. Uh, Michelle. Yeah. All right. Um, well, it's it's actually not an easy question because I I think we should clearly separate you know what we would like to happen and what we are seeing is happening. Uh, yes. You know we have to have our desire on the one hand, but then also we have to be really realistic. Um, and I'm anticipating that I'm a bit different in my conclusions than John about this. Um, so. What, what am I seeing? Um, I, I'm seeing that we reached uh, peak globalization. I'm, you know, it's, it's there in the statistics, global trade is going down. And I think we are seeing already a kind of continentalization of uh, trade. Uh, so the Corona shock has wakened up the worries of the elites about their supply chains, and so you see a lot of movement where you know the the supply chain is made shorter, like on a European basis, on the you know China and Asia, uh, a decoupling of the U.S. with the China and, and those kinds of things. Um, I also see um, revival of the state, um, very strong. You know the left is kind of imploding right now. It's it's less than a quarter of the vote in most countries going you know back from 50 percent uh, even 15 20 years ago and the uh, right-wing populists uh, are quite successful in reviving their states i'm thinking about poland hungary and you know I'm, i saw a recent uh, study that showed that the bottom third of the population is best off in these countries not in the social democratic countries. so 
um, so this is a strong argument. I think that we shouldn't dismiss the state at all, even though, of course, if in the US and you see all the mess, you know, I think uh, you conclude yeah. that the, the, the country is imploding immediately and who knows, it, it might happen. Uh, but I think the US is a special case, but there is a strong, strong uh, counter move now to control global trade and to control migra migration. Uh, so this is, I think, one part of the reality that we shouldn't ignore. It's, it's there. You know, whether we'd be successful or not, that's questionable. But, but my argument against like full peer-to-peer -peer, uh, self-organization is that you know, any, any state that is in harmony uh, with nature and creates a more horizontal structure, if it doesn't have a state, will immediately be, if not wiped out, you know, will be kind of under the influence of, of stronger actors. So I, I think we have to be very careful with our dreams. Now, on the other hand, though, it's equally clear that self-organizing is growing. Um, you know, whether it's the one-sixth of GDP uh, in the U.S. economy that's around shared resources or the tenfold increase in urban commons. And of course, we can see that. I mean, I think people like us, we see that, for example, permaculture or fab labs. I mean, um, re most recently, I, I looked at multifactory uh, model which I think is a step further than Fab Labs because there's 120 of them in Europe and they're actually doing production. So they're craftsmen that neutralize their, uh, you know, factory and, and resource base, use open source methods and have an invisible factory where they cooperate across the European continent. Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing actually more than Fab Labs and that makes me optimistic that the kind of capacity of, to produce in a commons based peer to peer way is reaching at least like low capital production. I think that's a, a very good. So I'm just going to conclude. For me, the it's an open question how these two things are going to intersect. Um, um, so in other words, like a possible re-strengthening of the nation state on the one hand, and this kind of peer-to-peer trans-local organization on the other. And what I would stress and, and we're not doing that, is we absolutely need to create new institutions. I think that I'm kind of echoing what Indy Johar said about this, right? I'm thinking pretty much in the same way, but where Indy uses the word civics, I use commons, but I think we are talking about the same thing essentially. Uh, but I really think we need to focus on organization on, and, and we kind of undermined by social media in a way, because I just want to maybe finish with this. And you have to stop me, Lisa, because I tend to <laughs> babble <laughs> on. Um, so I think the problem with social media is that we create influencers. I would consider myself an influencer. Um, but are we leaders? Can we move the masses? That's a big question that I, that I have really questions about, right? That the, the very good, good appetite to whoever is eating uh, some chips out there. Uh, so we are. Can you guys take care of this? Sorry. Yeah, we 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 spend a lot of time uh, online, and I think that's that's an issue uh, for the for as the well. Future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So for you, um, I think one one good uh, many many points, but one good distinction, which is yes, in the question of um, thinking about the dance between you know, self-organizing and the s sort of uh, global scale is um, it, outside of our little movie in our head, the reality is playing out in a different way or it looks like it's a fierce competition to a lot of the, you know, what you call the dreams. So I think, yes, as we, as we leap to, um, to John and ask the same question, I think that idea of, you know, the, 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 where, from a practical perspective, we can we can confess, I suppose, John, uh, you know what our dream is versus you know uh, what do you what are you really thinking? And based on what you're seeing, how does that um, you know how do we incite a, a good kind a, the future that we want to see to the best that we can? Uh, the question back to you though was also um, as a as a potential bridge 
um, you know, you had made the comment I, I, on several pieces, and I'll pull up the the little quote, but essentially it's what you're referring to as you're saying that you see a rapid shift towards self-organizing communities and networks. And um, one is I was curious about the evidence, but mostly in the context okay. of, of answering the question of how you see the balance between you know, local and global. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi, John. I've been focusing most of my attention right now in the last three years with my uh, Global Guerrillas report on the intersection of technology, warfare, and politics which seemed to be the area that was moving quickest. Um, before that, I was focused on resilient communities. I mean, how to connect to the network um, on your own terms. So you're not dependent, but you can still get the benefits of the network, which tends to be the best resilient strategy. Um, you don't want to be totally disconnected from the network because it has uh, high costs and it's uh, difficult to maintain, but you don't want to be completely dependent on the network. Um, because it will go down periodically. And, and as we see, you know, it's uh, very vulnerable right now to uh, complex crises. Uh, kind of a, been working on a variant of the black swan is that the black swan, you know, as a concept is about this, you know, big unexpected event. And uh, what I'm seeing is something I, I don't really have a real good name for it, but it's uh, the black swan isn't really what we're seeing with 9-11, the financial crisis with the COVID, is that we're seeing a complex crisis, you know, sweep into the system and destabilize everything. And it keeps on giving because of its interactions with its, the social dynamics, the larger systems that are out there. Um, and that the systems of decision-making we have at the social level, uh, the ones that we developed since Westphalia, for the, you know, since the 15th, 1600s, uh, aren't capable of making good decisions in this environment in a, in a complex environment, as opposed to the complicated environment we had in the 20th century, uh, where engineering solutions that tended to work better. Uh, now uh, things are moving too quickly and they're, they uh, shift too quickly for these complex plans that bureaucratic organizations work, uh, work on. Um, one of the frameworks I'm using and that's useful is that the, the big social decisions making systems that started off you know, very clumsily um, back in the, as the Reformation kicked off, uh, have been refined over time. And the ones that we're using are uh, bureaucracy, which is kind of the cockroach of organizations. Uh, you know, Max Weber's you know, favorite area of focus, uh, markets and um, tribalism, kind of a refined tribalism that we see today is, is nationalism. Um, where uh, each of those systems add to our decision-making capacity as a, as a group, as a, as a, as a unit. Um, tribalism as nationalism allows us to cohere, to trust each other to a certain degree. Um, when, when nationalism breaks down, we see a loss of trust uh, where you start to see people who are formerly your countrymen or formerly people that you would have trusted as potentially uh, sources of disinformation or, or, uh, or uh, malicious information that would intent on, on destroying you. So you lose that, you, you can't even make a decision. Bureaucracies are great at mobilizing resources. They're great at uh, executing large plans, uh, large scale, small scale, uh, structuring information works great in science, works great in, uh, in government. And then you have markets which are great at allocating resources and discovering un, untapped sources of information. And those systems have been refined and, and they're probably maybe even a little decrepit right now, but they're really terrible at dealing with these big complex crises and they're not uh, moving us forward. So we have a new social decision making system, one I've been tracking, one I've been writing about. It's called uh, network decision making. Um, it's different and it's proving to be stronger than the other systems. Um, I started working on this back in 2003, four uh, with open source warfare, saw the open source model porting to uh, the war in Iraq and, and, and other insurgencies, um, came out of the warfare space. Uh, it provided a, a level of uh, difficulty for, in the counterinsurgency space that, that really caught everyone's attention. And I've seen it uh, grow over time. Um, what we're seeing in terms of uh, networked organizations, the decision-making systems uh, now 
uh, is that uh, social networking has brought it up to a whole new level. It's rewired our brains in a McLuhan sense. And um, it's uh, changing how we make decisions socially. I mean, just recently with the COVID case, uh, absent any kind of government decision in the United States and because we didn't have the data early on, uh, people made decisions en masse as a network to start to socially distance and start to wear masks and start to do other things um, well ahead of when the government actually said anything or did anything. And uh, our big failure as a, as a, as a, it, as a country, as in terms of the, how the U.S. responded to the crisis, uh, you know, outside of the, the structural failures of the, the bureaucracies, um, is that we didn't lead that consensus. We didn't lead that network consensus forward to solve the problems. Um, so, are you proposing that the the, the job of the um, are you proposing a tension between both? In other words, the the self-organizing aspect is kind of the fast prototyping and the resilient piece and that being connected to the greater global or national network is the scale consolidation rapid deployment like how do you see those tensions in the yeah um, i think it's less i think it's less of a focus on self-organizing it's uh, you know what i'm i think the biggest thing that we have to focus on right now is that we're seeing the development of a new social decision making system the one that's going to be transformational uh, it's not what we want it's what is it's what's happening uh it's uh, what you have to deal with what you have to work with and you have to transform it you have to shape it in a way that actually yields you know positive development i mean this this network decision making system uh, allowed uh an insurgency to take over the Republican Party. I mean, it trounced it in 2016, 2015, 2000. It took over. And we call it right wing populism, but it, it, the thing is, it, it really was an open source network applied to politics. Uh, it stood up, it took over the Republican Party, it's transformed the Republican Party. And now we see similar things happening on the left in the United States. Uh, a whole, a whole, you know, a whole you know, slew of, of open source networks taking over the Democratic Party. And they just barely held it on with Biden, but the thing is that they're in the process of being rolled as, as easily as the, the Republicans are being rolled. And um, we have to figure out how to make these regularizes and make these systems work in, in our favor. I mean, there's lots of benefits to network decision-making. Um, but, but I mean, it, it's faster. Is it, a, is it a, how do you know, how do you, how do you not see it or can it be seen as a signal that the actual institution is failing? Um, well, I mean, look at the response uh, uh, in the U.S., in, at least in terms of the uh, uh, bureaucratic response to COVID, and, and it made mistakes one after another. I mean, made mistakes in, in how it allocated the testing authority and, and it gave it all to the oh, CDC. Yeah, I'm not, and the I'm CDC. not disputing the mistakes. I don't think we have that long to, uh, <laughs> to, to analyze that part. But, but I, I'm just making the comment that you seem to be seeing the takeover of the Republican Party or the whatever Democratic Party as um, uh, a bad thing. And no, I think, it, I think it's more a what is, what happened. I mean, you gotcha. know, uh, you know I, I, in, a, in a positive, in a, in a system that works where we have uh, network decision making, at least from what I've seen so far, operating at, at, at a positive level is that we have a, a, a dynamic deten uh, tension between uh, consensus and dissent. Okay. Is that if there's a problem, we can get consensus really quick and it has to be narrow consensus. It's not going to be this broad, you know, million item watt list. It's got to be a very narrow consensus like be COVID or, you know, solve this specific problem and, and it lasts as long as the consensus is valuable and the dissent keeps on pushing against it and, and it rapidly rolls it up when it's not. But gotcha. here, the big the big danger with this, and what I'm writing about right now, is is that networks tend towards in this environment tends towards consolidation, and, and if it gets too much resonance in the system, that it will be the basis for a new type of tyranny and authoritarianism that that excels or exceeds anything that we've seen in the past, and that. Um, so, so in that case, like you're, I'm, I have the question for, for both of you and then, and then hopefully all of us later uh, as we go into the fishbowl is just, we're in a clearly very chaotic moment and, uh, and COVID has created a kind of what I call a blue dye effect where it's kind of 
gone in and highlighted all of the vulnerabilities or, or in some cases actually just broken the, the damn thing itself. Um, and I think that in this chaotic moment, and it's a really important uh, inflection point, you know, what technologies or what interventions uh, do you see, you know, borrowing on Michelle's comment about distinguishing between dreams and practice, you know, what are practical things uh, based on the direction you see us pointed in? Are there core perturbations or technologies that you think are, are could be uh, very effective and or missing right now? Can I, um, can I intervene because I'd, I'd yes, like please. to so I'm asking you. have yes. a, re a reaction. So what happened in the West was a massive state and market failure concerning COVID. And then this kind of peer-to-peer -peer coordination uh, networks, uh, you know, did their best to compensate these failures. Uh, but what we saw was that, it, it, that neither the state nor the market were ready to work with them. So the enormous amount of inventions in, and designs for masks and ventilators, you know, they just couldn't get in the hospitals because there was no inter-institutional design. And that's what I want to stress. So it's not enough to say, you know, the state, the market, and now this kind of what I would call the commons networks, the common centric networks, because they actually share knowledge and use shared resources. So what's very important is to design the cooperation between them. And, and that's where policy is still very important. So for example, if you take Italy, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but the Bologna regulation mm, yeah, that Bologna. allows you know, citizen groups to, to self-organize around urban resources, uh, which was then taken over by 250 different uh, other city, mobilized 1 million people. So in other words, I, I do think politics and policy is still a very important scaling uh, mechanism. And just to go back to the corona, you know, I live in Thailand and the states in East Asia were very effective, unlike the Western states. And so I live in a country with 200 times less mortality rate than Europe and, and the US yeah. be, because the state was working and doing its job, right? So, it's, so for me, it's really important to see that. It's like, okay, if this is true that the commons or the civic uh, networks and the collective intelligence networks are expanding uh, in a very significant way, which I totally agree with. But what, in what kind of society do we have an optimal design for the cooperation between different uh, institutional logics? So the logic of the market, and what I'm saying is we need markets that work for the commons. So we need generative ethical markets. So I'm thinking, for example, of radical markets or radical exchange project, but they don't see the commons. So I'm, I'm not 100% happy with what they do, but at least they're thinking in terms of, can we des redesign markets so they work for everybody? But the same goes for the state. And I, I would just stress that there has been never in history any collectivity with more than 200,000 people which didn't have a state. So it's mm. in, in, co in complex societies, the state will not disappear. But the yeah. form of state, you know, it might, it might be what Indy is saying about unbundling the state functions and creating these kind of collections of publics that could be a form that a state can take. For example, so micro, very, micro states or, but still at some point there's a collaboration required. Yes, and so it's very important. Required. And this is the difference between libertarians and non-libertarians for me is either we believe that individuals or groups can make agreements and that creates society. And I think that's not the case. We always live already in a society with norms and structures. Um, and so, so there has to be common good institutions, not just people that you know do their stuff for their own, but we need common good institutions. And you can give that another name, but that's really essential. And so the scaling mechanism, you know, what I call the partner state, I think is very important. And I, I think that is maybe also what Indy is hinting at, you know, what kind of form that could take. So I'll just give you one example and then I'll, I'll give the word to John. So one of the things that I'm saying is that in, in a context of state failure, we can use, for example, the cities for global governance, right? So uh, I talk about protocol commons, which is okay, all the cities need to mutualize because what is happening right now is as we hit all these resource peaks and climate change and ecolo ecological crisis, and if you listen to Piketty, right? So when 
when growth slows down under three four percent inequality rises it's been that's been the case for 2000 years yep. so we we're not going to a situation with more equality we're actually going straight to a situation with even more inequality than we have today um and okay now i lost my thread but uh, <laughs> uh, so yes we, uh, so we're going to have to do more with less and that's what mutualization is about every time in history when there is too much degradation and uh, you know we come out of an extractive regime hyper extractive regime the result has been like a restorative moment in which the mutualization the commons were used to heal those societies and i think this is a global scale a conjunction we have now we have a global degradation and we're going to need a global regeneration and the commons or networks whatever we want to call them are going to play a key role but imagine this every city need to mutualize mobility transportation habitat uh, or access to healthy organic food and they're all doing it dispersed so there is you know like 13 different softwares to buy food in just Duskany in the solidarity economy. I mean, this is totally ridiculous, right? So why not imagine that cities create coalitions where they can have uh, what Neil Gorenfuk calls a global urban common stack. That right, would right. be a state form. That would be a state form, the cities, the coalition of cities as a state form, the common good institutions would then work together with let's say ethical finance that would fund a part of these things and with the collectivities with the commons based networks that would do all the work to make it you know locally adaptable right so, so, that so would be, michelle on, on your dreamometer yeah. on your if, if that was a you know is it is that close to zero or is that close to 10 on on the dream um, side it's uh, well, on the dream side, it's 10, <laughs> but on the actual yeah, side, yeah, right? it's maybe yeah. one. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> it's one, but because, for example, I mean, because... what we see, what we see is, for example, Barcelona and Amsterdam are working together yeah. on housing. I mean, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Not just, right. you know, negatively regulating Airbnb and, and Uber, because that they're doing now, like, you know, Airbnb is being shut out of Amsterdam and Lisbon. So there is this kind of coalescing against the bad sides of these uh, platforms. But I don't know much about cities actually working together with other cities to actually do, you know, this kind of common sex. But there, there's some yeah. signs of it, right? There are signs. In the US, yeah. actually, there's, there yeah. have been uh, cities coming together actually around COVID. And I think yeah. there's a whole conversation to yeah. have and that maybe, we won't have and just time today. But just, just about cities, I think, is probably yeah. a, yeah. Simona yeah. one, one more team should is, make a note. Yeah, is viral uh, copying, right? So we see Ghent had a commons transition plan. Now Sydney has a commons transition plan. Amsterdam is working a commons transition plan. And I met Mayor Park, uh, but unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, he's no more. And so I don't no. know what's going to happen. But he said, literally, I want to make Seoul a commons-based city. Yeah. Uh, so big question whether it's going to happen now. But so yeah. this kind of copying, you know, viral spread that is also happening, of course. So so as an uh, as a yeah. technology like that, you know, if we think about uh, that's a technology that I would say we could um, encapsulate, figure out a, a clearinghouse, a way. There's a platform called Apolitical that connects, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, public servants and people participating in in civic activities or you know state government institutional uh, activities i think that that idea of basically uh kind of bubbling up things that are working and sharing them liberally and then copying what's working and refining that is a very open source kind of uh yeah, ontology that, that we can bring yes. you know and so that's that's something i think that we should take away from this as a technology to highlight and amplify in probably many different domains um, and John, you're, you've been yeah, quiet I, only because we've been we've been uh, not. I think I think that some of the trends, though, um, it's always good to be with the larger trends because if you're working against them, you're going to get rolled. Is that um, you know one of the things that we've built into our assumptions is that the population is going to keep on increasing, and outside of Africa, it, it's already peaked. I mean, it's it's on the way down, and that changes the dynamics considerably, particularly in regards to cities and in regards to allocation of resources. 
Um, and then what we're seeing quickly with the COVID is that we're seeing a, a rapid wipeout of retail infrastructure and, and a lot of the kind of uh, distribution architecture that we had and it's all being centralized and all, all being virtualized. Um, it's being squeezed down just like farming was in the, in the, in the 20s in the states, uh, in the 30s, uh, which caused the, you know, the Great Depression. Um, it's not the worry of AI coming in, it's the worry of all these distribution systems being squeezed out of existence um, by Amazon in particular. Um, and and to, not to the value that names. they create is, excuse me? I said not to name any names, but yes. Yeah, Absolutely. and I mean, yeah, getting it, I mean, get, getting the value and the number of people produced by that system down to, to something very, very small, but controlled by a, a couple large entities. I mean, the US, it's like 1% of the population farms. Yes. And in the, in the California economy, it's supposedly a farming system, but it's only 3% of their economy. And yeah, 70, it's industrialized. 60, yeah, 60, 70% of the water, right? Or 3% of their economy. And um, so we're seeing that. And so uh, the big shift in the value being created, the abundance that's actually out there uh, to be allocated is all going to be on the virtual side. It's all going to be on the, uh, uh, you know, what, where the, the, the chance to actually achieve, you know, more abundance for everybody. Um, we tend to think in physical goods, but the physical goods are, are, are getting cheaper and less valuable as a re in relation to everything else. Uh, well, and I, digital... think, I think part of, part of what you both, I'm going to have to, um, we're going to have to wrap up and, and, okay. and have our party elsewhere, guys. But I'm really uh, delighted to have the conversation because I think that you're, you're saying both in different ways that we need both, right? And that, you, that the resiliency at the local level and the 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 peer to peer the consensual connections those things are vital and at the same time um, you know the roll your own gov uh, isn't going to scale and in fact uh, the 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 powers it's not a bee horror movie where the the current institutions are just going to you know fall, fall down and 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 walk away uh, so there's this kind of uh, necessity for um, uh, well they 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 can become zombies. <laughs> well, they, they, I think that's been true. Yeah, I mean, we have we a lot have, of governments and, and government organizations now going, oh. I, I think we have one on our hands. But in any case, I, <laughs> I uh, thank you both for the conversation. It's um, a pleasure. And I'll, I'll look forward to, continue, to continuing it, hopefully, in person sometime. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>